very warm welcome uh, to all of you. Can I say, first of all, it is so utterly fantastic to be sitting here uh, looking out at a real live audience. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, thank you very much for being here in person. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I love book festivals, so uh, it's always a joy to be taking part in one. I'm particularly thrilled to be here with our guests today. I'll say a bit more about them uh, shortly, but can I kick off by saying a massive thank you to the organisers of Paisley Book Festival. It is such a stunning success and you know the, the growth of book festivals across Scotland and the growing success of book festivals across Scotland I think is something to be really, really proud of and Paisley is fast becoming one of the real uh, jewels in the crown of our book festival at Landscape. So well done uh, to all of them. I've been following some of the events on social media over the course of the week and it has been really, really fantastic. So uh, good luck to you as you go strength to, uh, from strength to strength in years to come. Uh, now on to uh, our guests. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Robin Marzak, uh, the uh, former uh, director of the Scottish Poetry Library. Um, Robin has published a number of books on uh, poetry, somebody who is incredibly uh, knowledgeable um, about poets and poetry and the role of poetry in society. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from her, but of course in particular, somebody who has been integral uh, to the process of appointing our mackers since I think 2010, uh, so many, many years. And we're going to hear a bit from Robin later on about what it's like to appoint a macker, what the appointment panel are looking for, what makes a good macker and how the mackers that uh, we've had so far, been very fortunate to have, might have, have differed. Um, and talking about good mackers, um, I am thrilled to be joined uh, by Scotland's fourth and current macker, Kathleen Jamie, a highly accomplished and renowned poet and indeed writer of prose and we might get into a little bit later on about how different it is to write poetry and, and prose. Uh, Kathleen has published many works, she's going to treat us to some readings uh, later on and in her first six months as Macker she has already I think made a real impact and I'm looking forward to hearing from her uh, what that experience has been and what she hopes and, and plans for the remainder of her term as Macker. It's no uh, understatement, I think, to say uh, that, uh, or it is an understatement, it's no overstatement to say that she had uh, massive acts to follow. Uh, Eddie Morgan, Liz Lockhead, Jackie Kay, but I think she is proving more than up to that task. Um, I'm going to ask Kathleen in a moment to kick off uh, with a reading, uh, and actually a bit unusually, a reading not of one of her own pieces of work, uh, but a reading from a Ukrainian poet. And, you know, we live in a time right now, and I don't want to dampen the mood at the outset, but we live in a world that feels is really difficult and really dark right now. We're emerging, hopefully, from a global pandemic, unfortunately, into the prospect again of war on our continent and I think that reminds all of us, it certainly rem reminds me of the importance of the arts and culture, of literature uh, and within that of course of poetry. The importance of that in understanding who we are uh, and our place in history but also the importance of that in thinking and learning beyond our boundaries, understanding others uh, in other cultures and other faiths and other parts of the world and that is so, so important right now. Um, before I hand over to Kathleen, I, and I'm far from alone here, as well as following the horror of what is unfolding in Ukraine uh, on a, an hourly basis right now, I've been trying to read in recent days a bit more deeply into the history of Ukraine because there is no doubt that there lies the roots of what is happening right now. It also tells us how utterly warped Vladimir Putin's perspective on uh, things really is. But there has been a name cropped up in so much of the historic uh, reading I've been doing, and it's not the name of a soldier or the name of a politician, it's the name of a poet, a Ukrainian poet that wrote in the uh, mid-19th century. Taras Shevchenko uh, is his name, and there's one poem in particular, uh, Calamity Again, and I would encourage you to go and look it up later on. 
And it's a poem about uh, past oppressions of the Ukrainian people, and it is so resonant. And I think it says something about the importance of writers in allowing us not just to understand the world as is right now, uh, but our place in history. And I'm sure all of us, uh, while we're sitting here in Paisley, uh, our minds are on what's happening in Ukraine. So before I hand over to uh, Kathleen, this won't make a blind bit of difference to people fighting such, uh, so bravely in Ukraine right now, but it might make us feel as if we're sending them a message of support. So let's send a message of solidarity to the people of Ukraine. And on that note, Macker, uh, would you like to do your first reading? I want to read a poem by a contemporary Ukrainian poet with whom I, I share a first name. Her name is Katerina Kalitko. It's called Home is Still Possible There. It's translated by Elena Jenkins and Oksana Lutkashanya. Home is still possible there, where they hang laundry out to dry and the bed sheets smell of wind and plum blossom. It's the season of the first intimacy to be consummated, never to be repeated. Every leaf emerges as a green blade, and the cries of life take over the night and find a rhythm. Fragile tinfoil of the season when apricots first form, along with wars and infants, in the same spoonful of air, in the stifling bedrooms or in the cold from which the wandering beg to enter like a bloom of jellyfish or migratory blossoms. The April frost hunts white-eyed, sharp-clawed, but the babies have the same fuzzy skin for protection. What makes them different is how they break, when the time comes for them to fall, or if they get totally crushed. Behind the wall, a drunken, one-eyed neighbour stumbles around his house, confusing all the epochs. His shoulder bumps into metal crutches from World War I, a Soviet helmet made of cardboard, and the portrait of a man with a glance like a machine gun firing, and hangers for shirts, all of them with a single sleeve. So they will fall and break into pieces and fates, branches parted, fruit exposed to the winds, the neck feels squeezed in the narrow isthmus of the throat, time just stands still and mustard grass creeps through the ditches. All of this is but a forgotten game we play in the family backyard. Hiding amongst the laundry that hangs outside, the world becomes more fragile at each moment. And when you suddenly embrace through the cloth, you don't know who it is, and whether you're lost or found. And the swelling parted body of war intrudes into a blossoming heart, because we didn't let it enter our home on a cold night to warm itself. I think that Thank poem you. reaches across 150 years of, of calamity, it really does. doesn't it? Absolutely. It compresses them. Yeah, look, that's been, uh, I think, a really, a really profound and special way to kick off our discussion today. So thank you for that. And we're going to hear some readings of your own work uh, yeah. later on in the session. Uh, Robin, let's kick off uh, with you. You've been involved in the appointment of uh, Mackers for uh, many years now. Um, the title of this session is What Max a Macker? So tell us, what Max a Macker? And when you go through the appointment process, just talk us through the nuts and bolts of that, but what it is you're looking for in coming to that decision? Well, it, it, it all began in 2004 uh, when I wasn't involved, and that was with Jack McConnell, who was then the First Minister, uh, deciding to honour Edwin Morgan with the title of Scots Macca, uh, just as a, an indication really of his life in the nation, of his life in literature in Scotland, of what he meant to Scotland. Uh, it was a wonderful decision, I think. And it comes back to the idea, I suppose, of the Maccas in the 15th and 16th century, uh, Henryson and Dunbar, for example, so those medieval figures. Um, and the word Macca itself, of course, is Scots, and it has, I think, a really particular tang about it, you know, because if you call somebody a poet laureate, you sort of imagine them uh, lying on the ground somewhere with, um, 
with a wreath of laurels around their head. And that's what you do, presumably, yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. I'm not and, here. and possibly not writing at all, but kind of <laughs> resting on their laurels, literally. Um, but here we have Maka, and here we have a real sense of process, of making, of, of language as a tool, of something that you work with. So it's a vision of a poet as somebody who makes something with words. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important part of the title. So Eddie, of course, was magnificent. Um, and his main contribution as Maka, because he were, this was later in his life, of course, was to write the poem for the opening of the Scottish Parliament. And uh, a poet I know in New Zealand said to me, I think that's the best public, modern public poem I've ever read. Yeah. It is a superb poem, and it doesn't lose any of its strength or its point um, as the decades have gone by. And what he wanted, what he thought the nation wanted, was an openness, an inquiry, an ability to discuss things, uh, rationally and, and with real feeling for what the people of Scotland wanted. So it, it was a real clarion call. Uh, cross, it, didn't, it didn't depend on your party. So he set the bar really high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's also funny. And it's also funny. It is also funny. So he hadn't lost either his humour or his passion for Scotland, which is very clear in that poem, mm -hmm. or his feeling of the poet's link with the nation. So it was, it was a great beginning, I suppose. I'm just going to now condense everything. <laughs> um, and uh, his successor was Liz Lockhead, who was also his successor as a poet laureate, in fact, in Glasgow. And I think that what she brought to that role, well, how, how that was decided was that um, a, a number of people met, people who, from the poetry community and literature communities, and they came up with a short list, and this list was presented to the then three first ministers. And the three first ministers went into a conclave and decided who it would be. Um, and I was, I was in the position of having to present that short list to the First Ministers. It was quite an unusual thing, I think, to just sit there reading poetry to them. I think that was um, an experience. I don't know whether they relished it, but I, I rather did. Um, and they chose Liz Lockhead. And of course, she was, um, she was wonderful. She came into post in 2011, so the year after Eddie died. And... Um, with huge relish for the task, I think, um, and a very, um, a very clear idea that she would be available to people uh, who felt that the Maka could in some way speak for them. And I think uh, one remarkable poem that she composed was uh, to do with the um, uh, advertising a call for, for the um, Scottish uh, system where you where you um, look at young children in, in trouble, and she wrote about f in the voice of, of a troubled young person, and it was it was excellent. But she also had recently lost her husband, and she and she wrote a wonderful poem for the um, for people uh, working in palliative care, mm. and so she had both that national feeling, but also something that came out deeply from herself, personally. Um, succeeded by, it was wonderful to see, um, by the same process, um, by Jackie Kay. Uh, so, as it were, Liz's younger sister in the art. And uh, Jackie went the length and, length and breadth of Scotland um, in, in, in bringing out uh, poetry where, wherever she could. And she too had both a kind of a national and, and a very personal um, approach to the, to, to the post. Um, the personal approach, as the First Minister would know, sometimes involved bringing her parents to a reading, um, and, and they got involved in it as well. Uh, so it was a very, it was a familial, very personal um, uh, way of approaching things. 
And then we had to find somebody to succeed, Jack, to succeed Jackie, and that panel was widened and broadened, and we had a discussion, and it was decided um, by the Parliament that, and the First Minister that instead of the First Minister's choosing, that the panel would choose and bring it as a recommendation to the First Minister. So uh, I didn't get to read any of... Uh, of Kathleen's poetry to the First Minister, who probably had read it all herself. Um, I'm just sitting here thinking that it would be a nice way for me to start every day with having somebody <laughs> reading poetry to me, so... I'm I up for it. Yeah. <laughs> we could provide a roster, I'm sure. Indeed, yeah. uh, And so along came Kathleen. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, potty history, very interesting potty history of the... Uh, the Macker, and they all have brought something very different but very, very special to the role. Uh, you know, Eddie Morgan's poem for the opening, the original opening of the Parliament, I still periodically will go back and read that, you know, because it is a source of such inspiration. It is a great reminder of what public service should be about, what we want our Parliament to be, the ambitions that we want to imbue uh, the whole country. So it, uh, it is something I think generations of politicians to come will go back and look at and read and, and take inspiration from. So Kathleen, um, you might at, at some point soon want to read us uh, something from your own work, but tell us from your perspective, you know, when did you realise you were being considered to be the, the fourth macker? What's it like to be macker? What does it mean to you? What, what have your early experiences been? Well, I'm, I'm six months into it, I think, and it's been... Um, when did I first realise? I thought like, intimations that I was being considered before I was actually mm. asked, you know, and then, of course, I was asked. Of course, I, how could I say no? It's, it's, it's a great honour. And at this age and stage, of course, it's a wonderful... Um, sort of a validation you know, of, of what I've been quietly plugging away at for, for 40 years. It's slightly odd because, like most poets, I work alone in a garret, you know, <laughs> and it is, there have been times of intense loneliness plugging away at this, and then very quickly you become a public person. Think, my goodness, this has been going on all the time, that, that, that poetry has this... I'm still coming to, to understand just how big a public role it has, you know, and every, every week a new request or a new invitation comes and I think, my goodness, the reach of this thing, you know, as a practitioner, I didn't actually know that. That may sound odd, but um, so I'm now, I'm now coming to a new understanding of what poetry is and how it functions in, in society and how it's, what needs it can meet and those needs can be met in different ways and they need to change. So it's that it's, um, actually it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> when I started out in my teens, I was a bit ashamed to be writing poems and I was made to feel a bit ashamed. Why? I just, I find that fascinating. One of the, the world's most renowned poets is a Scot, Robert Burns. We, you would think that in Scotland it would be a source of great Pride. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested why well, I might be. I might be misremembering. No, I'm, I'm sure you're not. I'm just up. interested in understanding. I think um, I had, uh, like many people, a Presbyterian background yeah. that frowned on work that wasn't Enjoying obviously. yourself. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> that, that frowned on work that wasn't um, yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. paid work. Yeah, yeah. My nana, my dear nana, whom I loved, I remember her slipping me a tenner that she could ill afford and saying, don't be spending it in any more of the bloody books. You know? <laughs> so, but I did spend it in books, of course. But there was, there was, there was that a slight mistrust, yeah, yeah, a yeah. slight mistrust especially of, of um, fiction and poetry. You know? is there, is, I mean, this is a question because I'm not sure what I think. Is it a, a perception in Scotland that poetry is kind of almost elitist for the... I don't believe no. so, but just because of Burns. Yeah. Know, I, don't, I don't believe mm -hmm. there is. No, mm -hmm. but it's just slightly odd. I don't think that's any longer the case. I think so many youngsters are getting into it. You know, yeah. The performance poetry has done wonders, yeah. you know, so that, that's gone, I think. But for myself, 40 odd years ago, it was my secret thing, right, yeah. you know, uh -huh. and um, kind of it still is my you. secret thing. It's <laughs> not so secret anymore, <laughs> though. I, I, I hate to break it to you. you. Know so <laughs> what's the, before you, you maybe share uh, some of your work with us. What, what's been the highlight of the six months? Has there been a highlight? You, I mean, your poem for the, the opening of the current session of the Scottish Parliament was 
that wonderful. Was, my first event was the opening of Parliament, and um, as you know, because you were there, I was seated in a sort of balcony, looking down. I was looking down on the Queen, Prince Charles, <laughs> the First Minister, her ministers. You I think, the microphone. Thinking, I'm quite enjoying this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it should always be, the sort of poets of the world look down on the rest of us. So I have to admit, I, did, I, I wrote a poem especially for the occasion and um, I did quite enjoy delivering it, mm -hmm. like, looking down on you so. Yeah. Uh, well, you did, I mean, the poem is wonderful, but you, you delivered it amazingly. I, I always I remember the same with Jackie when she did it at the start of her term, kind of looking up there and almost feeling nervous for you because it's, it's quite a big occasion, and, but you were, you were phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. So there's that. And then um, opening of Parliament, the next thing was that the COP summit and I knew immediately um, I wanted to do something public for, for that, mm. uh, involving the public, because it was such a massive event. And this week past, it's been the climate crisis has been blown out of our minds by, by other events, but it's still there. It's still, to my mind, the most important thing on the planet. You know. And COP26 is going to happen in Glasgow, and absolutely had to address it. Everybody had to address it, as artists, as poets, as politicians. It was there, and I thought, I, I need, I want to do something about this. So I convened a public poem, um, asked anybody who wanted to, to send me one line of poetry, one line, and a thousand of them arrived. So I curated these, which is several hundred more than I was told to expect. <laughs> the game. So I created them into, into poems, and we made little film poems of them, which are very beautiful, and still available on the Scottish Poetry Library website. If you haven't seen them, please do have a look. They're gorgeous. And so that sense of being able to have the resources through, through the Poetry Library to say, do you know what, I'd really fancy involving the whole country and writing a poem, and they go, yep, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a big step out of the garret for me. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying that sense of being able to command resources which are easy, cheap, and effective. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I think there's a nice moment on that um, one of those films where you see Kathleen with Tupperware boxes full of poet lines of poetry, you know, so <laughs> it has both a domestic Absolutely, feeling, yeah. um, but also plucking lines out of the box. It's still my it? desk, actually. Yeah. I, yeah. I do enjoy having it there. We've got more material than we use in the, in the wee poems, than the wee films, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to do a bigger, a bigger something mm -hmm. with this material. Or, use that same technique to do something else in the future. Mm -hmm. So there was that, and the sense of being able to, to I'm going to say the word command, that's not quite the right word, to, to encourage Summon. that participation, <laughs> summons, yeah, mm -hmm. have that participation. So it's almost like being a conductor of an orchestra, <laughs> bringing it a bit all. Like, yeah. yes, uh -huh. yeah. So I thoroughly enjoyed that, mm -hmm. and then the, the COP summit came. Since then, that was November, January was pretty well taken out by, by COVID. Things had to be cancelled. But this month, things are starting up again. I've got events with the Disasters Emergency Committee, speaking about Afghanistan, another thing that's been blown out of our heads yeah. this week. Yeah. Um, I'm doing something for the Women's Climate Strike outside of Parliament. It's <laughs> <laughs> her polite way of saying she'll be protesting against me. <laughs> um, there's something else coming up, I've forgotten about. Various festivals. Um, we've just, you mentioned festivals, Stanza Poetry Festival is coming up, it'll be mm -hmm. there. And, and that's as far as the diary reaches at the minute. Fantastic. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, obviously timely and right, but it's interesting how uh, often there, when you just took us through your first six months, how much climate um, sort of cropped up. COP26, obviously a big reason for that, but so much of your writing is about our landscape and environment, so it's, it's always been a really key theme. Uh, of your work. Do you want to give us a, a reading? Should we do that, the, the Clyde COP26 poem? Yeah. Yes. yeah. When I took on the, the post of, of, of Macker, um, it's a three year tenure, and I thought I can bring to this a theme, if you like. Everybody can bring a theme, and mine is going to be nature and the environment, and, and that's, I'm going to try and orientate myself through it by, by using the, that as a touchstone. We had our public poem for COP26, but when it finished, I was left with a feeling of, of something being unresolved. Um, I think many, many people felt that. Something just hadn't been finalised, closed, and um, I thought, we need, we need some, something to lock it down. And I was thinking about the river, 
and how it was flowing past the venues where all these, these fine words are being spoken. And of course, it's a um, post-industrial river. You know, and I know it's been cleaned up a great deal. But um, So I was thinking about what the Clyde might have to say about, about what was going on on its banks. So this is my... Excuse me, an inhabiting of the Clyde. What the Clyde said after COP26. I keep the heed. I'm cool. If asked, but you never ask, I'd answer in tongues hinting of Linz, of Leven, Nethin, Kelvin, Cart, but neutral, balancing both banks equally as I flow. Do I judge? I mind the hammer swing, the welder's flash, the heavy steel-built hulls I bore downstream from my city. And maybe I was a blatherskite then, a wee bit full of myself, when we seemed guy near unstoppable. But how can I stomach any more of these storm rains? How can I slip quietly away to meet my lover, the wide-armed ocean? Knowing I'm a poison chalice, she must drain, drinking everything you chuck away. So these days, I'm a listener, aye. Think of me as a long, level, liquid ear gliding slowly by. I heard the world's words, the pleas of peoples born where my ships once sailed. I heard the beautiful promises. And sure, I'm a river, but I can take a side. From this day, I'd rather keep afloat like we folded paper boats, the hopes of the young folk chanting at my bank, fear in their spring bright eyes. So hear this, fail them, and I will rise. Wonderful, wonderful. That must make you pretty proud to have helped select Kathleen as, as the macker. Absolutely. And yeah. I was just wondering whether that feeling of um, hesitation about declaring yourself a poet also came from, historically, that there was a kind of a gap in poets writing, uh, women poets being published. And so uh, it's really with Liz's generation that we start getting to hear women's voices again. Mm -hmm. And so at last you have somebody that you can actually go to and hear live. Liz Lockhead was such a, a, a visible presence in my, yeah. in my teens and early yeah. 20s. I mean, she was a very dramatic appearing yeah. person, yes. and, uh, which I certainly never was. I <laughs> literally rings, uh, 30 rings in his hands <laughs> and, and shoes. You know, so so have, to have the, her dramatic mm. persona, you know, bo both a attracted me and thought, I, I just can't do that. <laughs> But um, th that generation that, that she represents were very important to me because they were alive and making poems, you know, and, and people walking down the street and you go, oh, that's a poet, mm, you know, that mm. mattered. Yeah. So to have that available as a, a possibility because I, I was meeting people who could do it, that was, that was vital to me. Yeah, that's so, so important, I think, in all walks of life to have visible representations of what it is you aspire to, mm -hmm. to make it feel possible and, and mm -hmm. achievable. Now, I referenced earlier on, you write poetry, you write prose, mm -hmm. you write in English, you write in Scots. Yeah. It always fascinates me. I, I remember having this conversation with Jackie previously before, who writes prose as well as poetry. There must be different thought processes and writing processes involved. Um, or am I completely well, wrong? There must be. But, um, <laughs> Are you <laughs> conscious of them or do you just write what? Do you, do you sit down to write a poem? or write a piece of prose, or do you sit down to write and then it depends on what comes out that determines a, a what form of, it a is? A bit of all of that. I, if I'm working, if I am working on a piece of prose, it is possible to sit at my desk and just do it for the morning. I can't do that with a poem. Mm. Poems are more fugitive and I've got to literally hide them about the house and come back to them and, and secrete them away. Um, so there's something still, you know, Maybe it's necessary. Maybe what I said about being a teenager is it's actually necessary. It's necessary that it's hidden and fugitive and undeclared. Uh, the prose is less so. I can just sit and do it. There, to be very technical, there, there's different attitudes to time. Mm. Uh, a poem, somebody once said a poem is like a chord struck, but prose is like a melody. Prose can unfurl over time. 
and there's, there's that. If I need, I'm thinking about something on playing through time, it has to be done in prose. Poems allow more imagi imaginative leaps, um, more, more simile, although I do like to fold them into the prose as well. I sometimes think though, if I interrogated it too much, it would just go away. So I, I, mm. don't, I don't ask myself very often why things are as, as they are. The only thing I can't do is fiction. I absolutely cannot write fiction. Yet. <laughs> no, definitely not. It's never, and because I don't have a moral compass. Sorry? Know, <laughs> not, if I write fiction, it's just oh, me. Whoops, did we make the wrong decision? Yeah. <laughs> did you know that? No, no. Before, no. I forgot to ask the moral question. <laughs> it's just me making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, that's what you, yeah. No, no, real fiction writers, they, yeah. they, they're wise and they know. If, if I have a character who leaves the room, I don't know if they're going to the bathroom or going to Barbados. How am I supposed to know? You know? But proper fiction writers know, know their characters. I, oh, I can't even do that. That's a, fa that's a fascinating insight, actually. Um, I mentioned earlier on, Robin, you might want to, to say something about this. That I mean, I, I think culture, the arts, literature is such an important integral part of, of life and, and who we are. But at times like this, it just feels, certainly to me, that it is even more important, uh, not just for all the, the reasons of broadening, broadening her, her, her horizons, but also that sense of comfort that I think it can bring to help people understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Is that something, you know, you obviously teach literature, you write uh, mm -hmm. poetry, is that something you're conscious of at a time like this, that it, it is so much more important? Um. I think it works two ways. So you mentioned the word comfort, and I think that literature can have a role in uh, expressing grief, and we could hear that in that Ukrainian poem, that there is a grief note underneath the spring note, mm -hmm. and uh, a poem and literature can hold those things together in one's mind in an extraordinary way so that I think that what we're presented with in newspapers and, and uh, television and so forth is often only striking to take uh, Kathleen's word, is only striking one note, whereas poetry and literature in general has the melody. It has, it's holding a lot of notes together. So it's not simply that it might bring us comfort, though it can bring us comfort to know that others have been through this situation that we're in, whether it's grief or, or love, um, and that uh, they express it for us when we're inarticulate ourselves. But also, it's their role also, I think, to complicate things for us, to make sure that we're not seeing things in this narrow or, or single note way. And I think that's a, a, a fantastically important thing mm -hmm. that art can do mm -hmm. for us. Um, yeah. Do you, Kathleen, because I, I, I think that's so important, do you feel, I don't know, I, as somebody who's written poetry for a long, long time mm -hmm. since you were a, a teenager, keeping it secret, to being our national poet mm -hmm. now, particularly at times like this, do you feel an added responsibility to write poems that don't just capture life as we are living it, but poems that future generations will be able to look back on and read and understand something of what life is like now, but also use that to effectively, you know, help navigate life as it will be then. Does it, is there a greater sense of responsibility in, in what you're writing right now because think, of the position? I, I never think about future readers, actually. In fact, I never think about readers. Um, but when, when I'm actually working on a piece of work, I don't have an a, a yeah. idealised reader over my shoulder yeah. looking down mm -hmm. on it. You know, the relationship is entirely to myself and the words, you know, getting them right, getting deepening, complicated, simple, whatever it is I'm doing. After the poem is done, then I can hand it over to the readers, yeah. you know, but certainly not, not well, the poem is live, as it were. Um, do we have a responsibility? I think the responsibility to the future and to readers will look after itself if we get that responsibility to the poem right. It says a responsibility to possibly to truth, get that right, everything else will look after itself. You know? mm -hmm. 
I often often think about these things whenever some new what was that word calamity blows up. I think, mm. do, do I need to respond as a poet, and if so, how? Or is my greater responsibility to write a good poem rather than a relevant one? When they, you know, and I think it's to write a good poem, so I may not be able to to meet every public event, you know. Mm -hmm. But often that often that relevance emerges yeah. years and years later. Indeed. When you think, oh, I thought this was about s such and such, but actually now I'm reading it 20 years later, it is speaking to me in the situation I'm in now. Yeah. So that, that relevance uh, comes about in various ways, not always just related to the thing itself at yeah, the time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is why we need good critics. Mm. We've got a lot of good poets, but we're very few good critics. And a good critic will say to you, again at that poem you know that you wrote 20 years ago you know what it, what what you're writing about really and I go no 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 of course not I think ah. and you think oh, actually you're right yeah. you know so we need we need people eventually to read closely and tell us as, as a culture you know, mm -hmm. what yeah we're, what we're it's about. interesting I think sorry no I was just going to say that there's a poem that I think Kathleen's going to read which is comes out of the pandemic I guess the, mm -hmm. the lone tree yeah um, mm -hmm but it's not set about with COVID yeah. references yeah. or, or mm -hmm. masks or whatever, um, but it can be read now as a pandemic poem and maybe 20 years later, when people are reading it, they will have a sense of what it was like, yeah. mm -hmm. but it hasn't got that word anywhere. In yeah, no, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I think um, you're absolutely right. It's often years later that the relevance mm -hmm. and resonance of poetry mm -hmm. But it, it almost strikes me that, as a reader, um, that there's something more, I suppose, about the, the sort of chronicling of our ages. Almost, it's not, not like journalism, but more like that than, you know, a no novelist, for example, that, that are capturing the essence of life right now. And it may be that we don't read it that way right now, but we'll come on to do so. Oh, I mean, if you think of the... Um, the the two towers, the twin towers, and when they came down, and everybody was quoting Auden, which was a poem yeah, he exactly. wrote in 1939. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden it had that kind of, he, he was consciously writing a poem about his period, but it was, Indeed. But, but it could be harnessed. And, yeah. and so mm -hmm. he chronicled it at the time, yeah. certainly, mm -hmm. but then it turned mm -hmm. out to be all too, all too relevant right. to what yeah. happened later. And there's, there's probably very few things aspects of life, things that happen that you couldn't go and find some lines from Burns to be relevant exactly. to, yeah. to what we're going through. Just before that, you might want to, we're going to take questions from the audience in about five minutes, so this is your cue to get questions ready. Um, you're going to read us another poem in a minute, but, yeah. well, you do that and then I'll, I'll maybe... Okay, this is the poem to. that Robin just mentioned as being, as being a pandemic poem, and, and I, it's also one of those ones which is very personal to me, um, unlike the, the, the opening of the Parliament or the, the COP26 poem, this was definitely written of, of my own experience. About a year ago, almost to the day, I think, we, was, we were in lockdown again, and I just had the most weepy morning, um, thinking, I'm just never going to see my kids again. You know? Nonsense, of course, and I certainly have seen them again. But just for a few hours there, I sat and cried. And I thought, come on, Kathleen, get up, get out. You know, go, go a walk. And... Don't make yourself write a poem, but make yourself write a few wee phrases. Just do it as an exercise. And um, I did, and I'll read you the poem, but if you can see the way it's laid out, that's the way the poem... And after I, um, I wrote it, I thought, oh, it's, it's balancing. And it's, I, was, I was out of balance in my mind, and the poem has rebalanced me. You know, Seamus Heaney's work, incidentally, is full of balancing mm -hmm. and yokes and, and weights and getting things on an even keel. So this is called Lone Tree. Trudging again to Lone Tree Lookout, high in the grasslands of Sparrow Craig Hill. Pallid winter sunshine enlivens the skyline. Scarves of mist wander the strath below. No sparrows, just a crow cawing from a pylon. Fox turds by a tussock, pin-sized bones. There you wait, crooked elder of the pasture. I step inside your shadow, outstretched on shallow snow. Our two forms merge, my lungs breathe within you. May a missile thrush sing 
high in my branchy mind. So there you are, nothing, no pandemic. No. When you were talking about the circumstances in which you wrote that poem, I was thinking actually, when we reflect back on the, you know, the trauma and the loneliness and the isolation of the past two years, I, I wonder how many houses across the country have within them, you know, works of art that will never be published, of people who might have chosen to write and to process what they were going through in, in that way. Um, which kind of leads into the question I was going to ask both of you. Um, you, you said earlier, I think you said earlier on, Kathleen, that you thought amongst young people, poetry was really vibrant, spoken yeah. word poetry. Um, and I'm interested to know how we support that, how we you know, continue to ensure that poetry reaches all corners of the country, physically, but generationally as well. Um, and you both perhaps have thoughts on that. But secondly, what would you, and again, I think both of you would have interesting things to say here, what would your advice be to the, the teenager sitting in their garret right now uh, thinking that this is not something that they should be open about, no idea how to get published, or what, what would your advice be? But anyway, first of all, how do, we, how do we get poetry, bring poetry much more alive to the younger generation, even than it is right now? When dealing with the young, part of me just wants to get out of their way. <laughs> and I don't think I would have relished when I was 15 in my garret not that I had a garret but you know what I mean mm. I don't think I would have relished somebody of, of my mature years coming in and saying no this is what you need to do next you know I would have just cleared out their way and let them find their own route but then I grew up before the internet you know and that's that's transforming and the transforming the way people mm. are communicating with each other and producing work and making work and I'm not native to that so again, part of me thinks we'll just you know, let them navigate that because I'm not going to get it right. <sighs> I don't know. I would have faith in them. Stick at it. Believe in yourself. Yeah. yeah. Just let them, okay. let them Look at people like you and know it can be done. Robin, you work with young people. Well, um, it's just come to my mind when... Kathleen mentioned the internet, so at Stanza, the, the uh, Scotland's annual poetry festival, we've just introduced a new program called Scotland's Young Maccas, and that is for people who are interested in poetry, and they, they could sign in themselves um, from their schools or from their homes and um, work with a kind of mentor for six, six weeks, um, hearing from various poets mm. about all sorts of things that they could do with words. And um, I haven't seen the results yet, but we're going to see them um, in a couple of weeks' time when Stanza opens. And I think that possibility of feeling wherever you are in Scotland that there's somebody who might look out for you and might and might uh, encourage you and that you might find that although nobody in your class was writing it or none of your friends were writing it, there was somewhere, somewhere in Scotland who was also writing and keen to be heard. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a nice, that can be a good feeling. It doesn't work for everybody, yeah. mm -hmm. but it can be a really good feeling. Excellent. And are there any names of young aspiring Scottish poets right now that are maybe not published or published but not yet well known that you would chuck out there to give people if they're, not, if they're not yet published, I haven't heard yeah, of them because yeah. I'm like I'm the same generation as Kathleen, so um, I'm really I looking books. for books. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but uh, th there are plenty of places that yeah. you can get that knowledge, um, and and the poetry library is an obvious place. Yeah, Scottish Poetry Library, a wonderful, wonderful resource for the country. Um, we're going to go to questions from the audience now. Um, so. I am going to, first of all, put my glasses on again and I will not see a thing. Um, we've got a hand here, right in the middle. Um, and please stick your hand up so that I can get a sense of who wants to ask questions. Yes. Thank you very much. That's been an absolutely fascinating conversation and so many things I could continue to discuss with you. But drawing a couple of the strands together, um, I wanted to ask the marker a particular question. And it links to what you were saying about people writing at home during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, we entered a global pandemic. Lots of people got ill, some people recovered. Very sadly, some people died. But there was a huge swathe of people at home who didn't get better. And 
in order to try and offer support with the Scottish Poetry Library, I started creating writing groups for people with ongoing symptoms of COVID. And we've um, been lucky enough to be featured at the Paisley Book Festival this year in a digital event on Monday. Um, so if you want to hear some up and coming poets who didn't wow. even realise pre-COVID that they were poets, yeah. you can watch that back. But I wondered if the Macker has any suggestions as to how we could help get some of those hidden stories of the second pandemic out into the world as part of her reign, using your command and your <laughs> ability to summon resources, which sadly I don't have at my disposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure you could find the, those resources, actually. If, if, um, I'm sure you're already working through the poetry library. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they, could, they could help you out. But it's a thought, actually. The, the collective poem that we did for, for the nature and the COP26, that worked a treat. So I, I would um, could look at that again, actually. Uh, it's a thought. This sounds like a connection waiting to be made here. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, I, your, your question is so... A, yeah, it's a thought. Yeah. I, the, again, the power of, of arts and, and culture to, to help, you know, the, sadly, many, many people living with long COVID. I visited... Scottish Opera in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago and was talking to them there about a project they're doing uh, using singing to help people with, with breathing but also the sort of mental health impacts of long COVID. So this is a, another great example. Mm. So yeah, I think that's a, a potentially very fruitful connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Got a question here? Hello, um, that was really interesting. So thank you so much. Um, I work in the community heritage sector, so I find that language and literature is just a really great way to connect people with their pasts. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting there, Kathleen, is you saying that you were almost a little bit ashamed of trying to be a poet when you were younger. And mm -hmm. what I've noticed working with some, a lot of marginalised communities in Glasgow is that there still is quite a suspicion about having a career in the arts, yeah. that it's not going to be viable. And I was just wondering if you would give me some advice that I can take back to those young people to, um, and also to alleviate the concerns of their parents, perhaps, yeah. as well. <laughs> oh, this is, this is a very personal one to me. Because, um, my, my mother was um, very not sure about it, and she didn't live to see, she, oh, she didn't live to see this, you know. I don't know. I, don't, I truly, truly don't know the answer to that one. What is it? What is it about our culture that is so impoverished? And impoverishing, and doesn't do what you what you are. Obviously, you're you're doing your best there. What is it about the arts that people are not trusting? What is is it? What is the fear? Yeah. Is it is it to do with income? In my experience, it is. There are young people you will either go to uni and you will get a degree and that will be you set up and you'll get a good job or you'll go into a trade and then yeah. you'll have a tangible outcome as yes. well. A, a poem is yeah. tangible to them. Yes, of you course. will have a proper job. That will, yeah, of course. Uh, and that's what you see a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, the, the, fear, the fear of poverty is yeah. real and, and right, you know. It is a thing to be scared of. Mm -hmm. So how can we bring the arts into a place where people can look forward yeah. to having a, a paying career or know they'll have a decent paying career elsewhere but can also have a decent life work balance so they can work with the arts as well. I yeah. don't. There's probably, to be fair, that question is, is possibly um, better targeted at people like me because we have to make sure, and it's something I think about a lot, uh, but I think we've still got a lot to do here, um, is how do we, if we accept and agree, as I've just been talking about, um, that arts and culture are an integral part of our well-being as a country, they contribute hugely to our economy, but they're much, much more fundamental than that, then we've got to have a system that allows those who make the arts and culture uh, to do so with a sense of financial security, even if that doesn't come through people paying initially for what they produce. And that is about how we support aspiring artists and writers. Um, so there's a lot, uh, a lot for government to do beyond what we're already doing, and I think it is a really important point of reflection actually now as we come out of COVID and think about the kind of society we want to, to build out of that. Yes, it's not it's just a charming reflection? hobby, is it? Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but sometimes I worry that people who are creating things, whether it's uh, poetry or writing or, or music or whatever, um, are not seeing the other side of things, which is 
hearing and listening and reading to those people who are out there creating as well. So it's a two-way support system, you know. You both, you want, you want to do it yourself, but you need to support other people who are doing it. Okay. And um, I, I always worry terribly when I was at the poetry library. I adore the idea of it being a poetry library. People have to... To, to, to flourish in the art that you want to practice, you have to read or, or listen or to other musicians or you have to go to the theater and see performances. You have to experience it from the other side too. So, I mean, one of the things that all artists need is the support of audiences. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Right, I see a hand here. If we get anybody before, oh, there's a hand right up the back. I've got my glasses off, so I can't actually see what it's attached to, who it's attached to, rather. Um, and then I saw a hand here as well, and I'll come, come there next. Thank you so much. Um, I wondered if I could ask you, I was very struck what you're saying about uh, attending the uh, Women's Strike for Climate Justice, and I was thinking about how the role of Macker um, kind of occupies this space where you can be making art which is very... Um, very much in praise of the nation, and you can also be making art which is very much in criticism of the state. Um, and I think that is such an important facet of democracy, and I think Scotland has done quite a good job nominating makers which, who are um, equally capable of both roles. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, please. I don't think the role of the maker is in any way to uphold the parliament, the government of the day, you know. I agree, yeah. for what it's worth. I'd, I'd be quite interested yeah. to ask the First Minister what she thinks the role of the market is. Well. <laughs> uh, um, but neither uh, is. What is it? Well, I'm still. F we are all still finding our way into this. What this market thing is, and I don't think it's a branch of newspaper journalism either. You know, it's. Um, a maker's not a columnist, you're not writing pamphlets. If the government of the day goes way off course, the maker as a citizen, you know, will certainly have a, a something to say on that. But I don't think that's our, quite our role. Mm. Uh, to challenge? Challenge, did you say? Mm -hmm. It's a question. Is that part no, of your role, do you think? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, told, I'm not sure the, mm. the negotiation between... Here I am with the First Minister. There's obviously a relationship between <laughs> the, 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 the maker and the government of the day. But what that relationship mm. is and should be, I think, is going to be eternally renegotiated. Yeah. And, and should be. So it's an, I, don't, I think the role of the maker, you know, the national poet, it is partly to chronicle our, our lives as we're living them. And taking everything Kathleen said earlier on about, you know, readers, what future readers make of it will take care of itself. It is hopefully in a way that future generations will look back on and help them understand. But it, I, I think it is also about being challenging, being, you know, poking where, whether it's government or any other institution needs to be poked to do that. Robin, you spoke about Eddie Morgan's poem at the opening, and I've said, as I do, I go back periodically and read that. But... I go back and read that when I'm feeling at my lowest about maybe not living up to what I should be doing or needing inspiration to kind of dig deeper and, and do things that are maybe difficult. So that's not a poem I read as validation of government or politicians. I read it as a very direct challenge to be better and to be bolder and to, to do things differently. And, and that, I think, and I think that runs through all of the work of or Macers, um, very, very strongly. Gillian Clark, who was the um, Welsh Poet Laureate, had an interesting thing to say, which I jotted down uh, in case it should be relevant. And she said, it's like, um, like the Lord of the Flies, but in no other way, uh, <laughs> like, like holding the conch shell. If you happen to be holding it, you can speak. And the trick must be to carry it carefully, not to drop it, and while holding it, speak with passion, truth, and persuasion. Mm. So that's a very open call, yeah. an open idea of the maca. Um, mm -hmm. And I noticed that Kathleen used the word truth yeah. earlier too. And you know, are we back to Keats? You know, truth and beauty are yeah. they the things that matter? Yeah. There's a question. I think here. Yeah, I can see. Microphone. 
Hi, um, I'm an English teacher and I was interested in what you said about sort of like engaging younger people within the writing process and possibly their reluctance to listen to people a lot older. But I find that poetry is a big barrier for them in terms of their own writing. They'll be absolutely up for writing personal experiences, short stories, they love a drama script, but try to get them to do a poem and, you know, game's a bogey, nothing's happening. Have you got any tips or any ideas in terms of, you know, specifically what we can do in education to engage children more with poetry? Because I fear that we, you know, by the time they're going, the number that might come back to it gets smaller and smaller as other things take over. The, the, the business of writing a poem, it might, might, I, that happens to me as well. You know, when I sit down to write a poem, nothing happens. And I have to uh, kid myself. So I might say to the children, we're not writing a poem. You know, you just take a scrappy old envelope, you know, take a scuzzy old pen and just put down a few words, you know, and jink round it, trick yourself, you know. And if they're threatened about the form, achieving a poetic form immediately, then, you know, very few people can do that. Yeah. So maybe it's just back off from the idea that you're writing a poem yeah. and a poem will emerge. Yeah. Um, but I am slightly puzzled why we keep coming back to this. You know, this, this poem is, is, is difficult, can't do it. Something seizes up in the head, you know, seizes up in the body. You know, I think what you just said there is fascinating. Don't, come, don't think of it as writing a poem. Yeah. You know, ask a young person to write down what they feel, for example, and see yeah. what form it takes oh, as opposed to... What yeah. Not even what they can feel, but just what can you see at the window? What yeah, it, yeah, what, yeah. Tell me about the shoes you're wearing. That, I and use see that what form portion, it you know? takes. Yeah. And they, once they go, oh, it's not a poem, I'm just writing about my, you know, my trainers. Yeah. You'd be amazed then at what can outflow from that. Put the pen in the other hand. You know, if you're right-handed, put it in your left hand. See what your other side of your brain wants to say. Mm. These, are, these are all little tricks and dodges that, 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 that work. When I was at school, I, I'm, I've become much more into poetry in recent years. I was a, and I'm a, a reader of novels. So when I was at school, what put me off poetry, to be frank, was this idea that there was a, a kind of set meaning to a poem. And yeah. if I didn't read it and immediately understand what that was, then... Mm -hmm. I was somehow failing and and it's taken me a long time to realize that actually you can bring your own to some extent meaning yeah, to, yes. to what you're reading is that meaning meaning <laughs> okay, we're due to finish any moment but I got the sense that there's quite a lot more to come here so yes <laughs> oh god it's, it's just, oh, do your poems have a meaning that you yes. want every reader to get or do you want readers to take their own meaning from I think you would banish the word meaning altogether. Okay, you know? well, that's, that's, <laughs> see, that, that's this relationship between Macker and government already <laughs> working. <laughs> you know, I th I th you, you, you maybe, you've maybe got it, though, why people are so fear mm. of it, that they're being, they're being conned or, or, or taunted, you know, mm. given a piece of work and told, yes, there's a piece of work, but there's also a meaning, and yeah. you're not getting that meaning because you're not smart enough. There ain't, right. often. But you must mean something when you write the poem. No. <laughs> I don't. I certainly, I'm certainly not writing code. Right. You know, I'm not writing it of a writer's poem, but a daffodil, yeah. but I really mean something See, that, else. See, no. that's interesting, because that is what I think put me off, this idea mm. that there was a hidden meaning and it was yeah. all wrapped up in language that I didn't really, and a form that I didn't really understand, yeah. and unless you could crack the code, yeah. you weren't smart enough to, exactly, to read it. Exactly, there's not mm -hmm. a code. Right, that, I think that's I really... Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, it's just, you yeah. know, just... Like that. See, I think that's really interesting, and yeah. I think that, that, for me, just that assurance makes poetry, I think, in itself, mm -hmm. much more accessible. And speaking about the, 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 the hesitant young people, maybe they are feared that they're not getting, digging enough meaning into it, or packing enough meaning into it. Just relax, it's fine. You know, it's only language, we all use language. It's just language a wee bit arranged. Just some of it, some of us pointing at you use it better than the rest of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there a final question? I'm going to ask Kathleen to treat us to a, a final reading from her work before we wrap up. But maybe time for one more question? Yes, here. Uh, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, I think it's really interesting that you've spoken about uh, subterfuge and kind of being lonely in the garret. But then the poems that you've read 
have had a kind of uh, like a sensuous quality about kind of coming together with nature, talking about the Clyde and its lover, the ocean, and then talking about finding shelter in the tree. So I just wondered how important it was for you to be out in nature and being together as part of something bigger, how that figures in your poetic process. I didn't catch that. So how does it feel to be out in nature and finding that? How does that figure in your political oh, process? Is, 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 is that important? Yes, be, being out, out outdoors, yes. I'm, I'm out certainly every day. Yeah, And that's where I just look and think. So you, do you have a notebook with you? Do you write it oh, down? Yeah, I never practice what I preach. You know, if I teach <laughs> students, I say, yes, take your notebook everywhere. But I never do. You know. <laughs> Because it feels a wee bit artificial, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think memory is a great editor and what, you, what I'll bring back home. D um, that poem, The Lone Tree, I can't remember now if I actually made myself take a notebook. I may have done on that one occasion and made myself, through gritty teeth, write down a few wee phrases and, and made my poem out of them. But certainly being out away on my own matters, matters a lot to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you want to round off by before I, I close things properly by giving us a final reading? Shall I do? Shall I say what it was? Yeah, yeah. Robin, Robin might introduce um, this for you. So she knows about it. This was this is a poem I love of Kathleen's, and it has a particular uh, genesis. So it came about because. Uh, the, the site at Bannockburn was being refurbished to celebrate the 700th anniversary and the National Trust decided that they would like to have some words incised on the rotunda. And uh, they worked with the Scottish Poetry Library and we, we asked various poets to walk around that ground and think about it. And of course it is a war site. Uh, it's not now a site of war. So how, so how they approached it was, was very different. And when we talk about the constraints of form, I, I was just reminding myself that the National Trust said there was be room for 671 characters on the rotunda, but there couldn't be more than that. There could be less, and in fact, um, or fewer, num fewer words, and in fact, some poets wrote very, very, very short poems. And Kathleen obviously hit the 670 mark, I think. Um, but it's a, I think it's a wonderful poem, and it has a sense, I think, of being a poem, and I think this is such a rare thing, that somehow always existed. And a, 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 Thank it's a you. very, very fine poem. Thank you. To, to write this poem, I did indeed um, go out. I went back to Bannockburn on my own and just sat there watching the wind and the weather and thinking, what would you have to be to survive here? because it's a cold, bleak spot, and the sight lines matter enormously at the battle. That's why there, it, was, it was fought there. So I was looking in the cardinal directions and thinking, why? Why did this happen here? And this, the, the landscape is integral to it. And you say the poem has always been there, and that's possibly because I managed to shoehorn in seven quotations from, from older Scots poets, so not much of this poem is actually mine. <laughs> so this is, and, and the form is, is the old Scottish tetrameter. Here lies our land, every ert beneath swift clouds, glad glints of sun, belonging to none but itself. We are mere transients who sing its westland winds and ferny breeze, northern lights and siller tides, small folk play in our part. Come all ye, the country says, you win me who take me most to heart. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for being such a fantastic uh, real live audience for us this afternoon. Uh, but my massive thank you to uh, Robin uh, for uh, giving us such a great insight into what Max and Mac are, the appointment process, but also her incredible uh, knowledge and understanding of the medium of, of poetry. And uh, thank you to our Macker uh, for demonstrating today uh, what a worthy uh, incumbent of that uh, very special role she is. Um, and we really look forward, I look forward to hearing uh, what's yet to come in your time as Macker. 
uh, and uh, as challenging and as uh, pokey as you like. Uh, <laughs> but I think we've been treated to uh, a very, very special session this afternoon from both Robin and Kathleen. So can you please uh, give them both a massive round of applause?